All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming to the Capstone presentations today. This is Alicia Hagberg and here is her Capstone presentation. Go ahead, Alicia. Okay, so for my Capstone presentation, I chose how stress and sleep affects students. I chose this topic because I think it's important to know how everyday things like sleep and stress can cause disrupting effects to our bodies and minds if we don't get enough or have too much. My goal with this topic is to educate people on how important sleep and managing stress is. With all the different things going on in our lives, it can be difficult to remember to value our basic needs. I want to help by giving, off some, by giving some ways to decrease the effects of being overly stressed or sleep deprived. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, I think you skipped one. What is stress? Stress is the feeling that we experience when feeling overwhelmed or challenged. Stress is more than just an emotion. Stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout our entire body. Our bodies respond to stress by releasing hormones such as cortisol, adrenaline, and norepinephrine. These hormones easily travel through our bloodstream and reach our blood vessels and heart. Next slide, please. Um, physical effects of stress. These hormones have a huge impact on our bodies over time. For example, adrenaline causes our hearts to beat faster and raises our blood pressure, which over time causes hypertension, meaning high blood pressure. Cortisol changes the inner lining of blood vessels to not function correctly. The early stages of triggering the process of cholesterol plaque. Cholesterol plaque is the buildup in the arteries, increasing the chance of stroke or a heart attack. Cholesterol also increases our body's appetite by telling our bodies to replenish our energy source with energy dense foods. This is why we crave comfort food. Not only does cholesterol cause a larger appetite, but extra body fat. The extra body fat isn't just a few extra pounds, but an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals called cytokine. Cytokine increases the risk of developing... Oh, um, next slide, please. Sorry. Um, cytokine increases the risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease and insulin resistance. These stress hormones also affect our immune system. Our body prepares to fight and heal after injury, but instead the number of white blood cells decreases. This can result in us being more susceptible to infections and a slower recovery time. To the right, I included a photo of some white blood cells and how they um, positively affect our bodies. Although acute stress can help you respond better to a flu shot. Chronic stress has been associated with shortening telomeres, which is the end cap of a chromosome that measures the age of a cell. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to be copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell's genetic code. Telomeres end up becoming shorter every time a cell divides, and when they become too short, they can no longer divide and it dies. Next slide, please. More ways chronic stress can sabotage our health is acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. Stress also plays a huge role in our digestive system. When our brain sends stress, it communicates to the nervous system. This brain-gut connection is what causes butterflies, as well as disturbs the natural rhythmic contractions that move throughout our gut. The disturbances can lead to irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, as well as changes in our gut bacterial's function and composition. Next slide, please. How stress affects our mental well-being. Stress causes a huge toll on emotional regulation. Emotional regulation is the ability to exert control over one's own emotional state. Stress, is, stress as well increases susceptibility to psychological conditions such as anxiety and depression. It has been shown that chronic stress can cause learning helplessness. Stress and emotional experiences can cause memory issues, trouble falling asleep, and trouble staying asleep. Next slide, please. Sleep. The intense electrical activities of our brains uses up a quarter of its entire energy supply. Sleep naturally occurs in regular intervals to allow a person to restore its energy. Sleep is also very important for our ability to form and restore memories. Slow wave sleep 
known as SWS, is a REM sleep phase, a phase of deep sleep where there is no rapid eye movement. SWS is linked to the processing of a person's recent memories, including emotional experiences that are re reactivated during sleep. Next slide, please. We need the effects of lack of sleep. We need seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Anything less is considered sleep deprivation. Studies have shown that when a person gets six hours or less of sleep in one night, their cognitive performance can be compared to someone who is 48 hours sleep deprived. It has also been shown that one night without sleep can result in a loss of about 30% of overall cognitive function and two nights, 60%. Students can be set up for academic failure simply by getting less than seven hours of sleep a night. Sleep difficulties is actually ranked third on the top list of factors that impact students' academics. Like stress, lack of sleep can cause the body to act in distress and release hormone cortisol. Disrupted sleep is associated with insulin resistance, impaired glucose tolerance, and low-grade inflammation. Next slide, please. Um, this slide... I have some photos. Um, the photo on the left is showing that most high school students don't get enough sleep. And then the photo to the right shows how sleep plays a significant role in our entire body from mental health disorders to joint pains. Next slide, please. Sleep and stress. Sleep and stress go hand in hand since stress causes our bodies to need energy and sleep restores energy. Sleep helps our brains process emotions such as stress in the situations that are causing stress. Not getting enough sleep can cause us behavioral changes and can make us more susceptible to feeling overwhelmed and stressed. Although stress can make it hard to get sleep or quality sleep, sleep is important to clear your mind and enable you to take on challenges without getting overwhelmed. By trying to get more sleep every night and staying away from stress when possible, you reduce your chances of immune system complications obesity, dying cells, memory loss, and other health and mental conditions. Next slide, please. How we can reduce these effects. Now that you know a large role of stress, now that you know how large of a role stress and sleep plays in our everyday lives, physical and mental state, let me tell you some ways to decrease these negative effects. Most importantly, get enough sleep. Sleep is a priority because it controls our daily functions and capabilities, as I has previously as I have previously explained. Along with sleeping at least seven to eight hours, daytime naps have been shown to help with proactivity. A 45 minute nap throughout the day can give a cognitive boost lasting up to six hours. Trying to minimize stressors and using healthy, healthy coping strategies can reduce excess stress and reduce destructive consequences of stress. Some strategies to reduce stress are meditation support groups, counseling or therapy, and refocusing your thinking, as well as breathing exercises. Meditation has been shown to improve excess stress. A breathing exercise that can help you calm down and refocus your thinking is the 478 breathing exercise. By breathing in for four seconds, holding your breath for seven seconds, and releasing for eight seconds can put your body in a relaxed state. Now I ask for you all to join me in this breathing exercise. Get comfortable, and now breathe in for four seconds, Release for seven seconds. Sorry, I messed that up. Um, you're supposed to be holding for seven seconds and then release for eight seconds. I feel more relaxed, do you? Now that you know the effects of stress and sleep deprivation and the ways to prevent these effects, you can live an overall healthier lifestyle and have a greater well-being. Thank you guys for watching my presentation. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Alicia. Um, questions for Alicia? Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi, Alicia, do you remember me? Um, yes, you were my uh, mentor in middle school. Correct. How you doing? <laughs> uh, I was wondering how much sleep you're getting for a night. Um, that's a great question. It varies. Um, I try to get the seven to eight hours, but sometimes a little less. 
Okay. And do you take naps? No. Okay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I take a lot of naps, so that must be why I don't get sick anymore. So I I loved seeing everything that you presented, and I use it a lot in my work here because I'm a counselor now, and uh, and definitely we see people who are anxious. They don't have as good memories, and they they get sick more often. So it's all true. All right, that's all I got. Good to see you. Thank you. It was nice seeing you. So what do you think um, is like the real connection between stress and sleep, Alicia? And lack of sleep, I suppose. Um, so I think that sleep and stress, like overall, like they all like intertwine and everything like, you know, impacts your body, like stress and sleep wise. So um, I think that the real connection there is that if you're really stressed out, um, your body needs to sleep to restore its energy and vice versa. If you're not sleeping enough, you have more of a chance of getting stressed out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so just stepping out of the research for a minute, what did you learn about yourself as a learner doing this capstone presentation? Um, um, I, well, um, I already knew that I procrastinate a lot. So doing this project, I found that I can push myself to do these, um, type of assignments as long as I put in the effort and, um, I'm a little more strict on myself. That's great. That's great. Especially going into the next phase. And is this something that you are, what made you choose this topic? for your capstone presentation? Um, originally I chose this because I wanted to reduce homework and like um, overall just like the amount of school that we have to do because when you look at your school day and um, like, you know, you have all these hours of being in the building and then you go home and you have homework and stuff and you have to get this amount of sleep and then like stress because of all of that. So. Originally, that was the direction that I was going in, but um, after, like, researching it more, I kind of veered into just, I found it interesting, and I think that it's important to know, like, how it all can affect you, because I didn't know any of this. Great. Um, all right. That is... Oh, hi. Oh, I have to say, got it on the thing. Okay. Hi, I'm Xander. Um, this is my caption presentation on visual effects and also sort of just how they're created and some of the things that can make them not be good sometimes. So uh, basically, I've been doing visual effects for about three years as a hobby. Um, and uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite things to do. So probably don't really know very much about visual effects, so let me explain them. Basically, visual effects are, they are it's, the, it's the process of changing things about video footage uh, after it's been filmed. So in like a movie, for example, if you need to add like a big explosion for an action scene in a movie, maybe they'd have practical effects on set, but that can be really expensive and unsafe. So sometimes they'll do it digitally with visual effects, things like that. Uh, it can be very simple and very uh, hard to notice things, like just removing a small object in the background, or it could be something really in your face where the entire scene is CGI for that whole part of the movie. So there's a lot of variation in how they can be used. So like I was saying, invisible effects are effects where you don't really notice because the point is that you're not supposed to be able to tell that they did anything at all. So. Um, Pretty much every movie now that you see, if you go to see a movie, you're, it's almost guaranteed that there's going to be like over a hundred visual effects shots in that movie, even if it's one that you wouldn't expect it to be in, because it's just sort of a huge part of the whole workflow nowadays. So um, yeah, even like a comedy movie, they're still going to have a lot of visual effects for like, just like replacing backgrounds for set extensions and making everything more uh, just it kind of can, it, it improves the production value on a lower budget. <clears throat> so here is an example 
of these uh, invisible effects. Uh, this is a visual effects breakdown of the movie Parasite. So playing video on Zoom is sometimes choppy, so I won't play too much of this, but um, just look at the background uh, in these shots and you'll see that the, the sets are not as big as they seem. So if you look back there, there's the blue screen. So it looks like a pretty big street, but it's actually kind of cuts off like 20 feet behind them. Uh, there's one more example over here, same thing, probably about 20 feet of street. And then here it looks like they have a whole house set. You'd never really expect it to be CGI, but actually they don't have much of the house and it's a lot of it is just totally CGI. So that's an example of invisible effects. And then some not so invisible effects to show the other side of the spectrum. Here's a breakdown of the movie Avengers Endgame. And you'll notice that this is all stuff that you wouldn't be able to film at all, like practically, just because what would you even be filming? So you can see here, it looks pretty realistic, but if they wipe away this, you can see that all of it was computer generated. So this is all just like a picture of the, of the software that they were using. It's, it's all computer generated for the entire scene. So the workflow, Start, I'll explain what all these things mean later. Uh, you start off with match move, then you go to 3D modeling and animation, then you go to lighting and shading, and then you go to compositing. So step one, match move. That's just where you have to figure out what the camera that you filmed, you have to represent the camera that you filmed the shot with in 3D space for a software. So the way you do this is you just tell the software where different points on the screen are in the frame throughout the whole shot. And then using the parallax between those points, which is like if you move your head, stuff in the background moves slower than stuff in the foreground. <clears throat> it just uses that information to find out where the camera is in each frame and also information about the lens as well. So you kind of have to do that for almost every shot that you do because uh, if a shot has camera movement, you have to account for it. 3D modeling. So a lot of visual effects is based in a 3D environment. So if you look at this screenshot at the top right, this is a screenshot of the software Cinema 4D, which is the software that I use for my 3D work. And this is a very simple setup. I just added a cube so you can see the 3D. This cube is a pretty, pretty classic 3D shape, I'd say. Um, so you can see it's like just kind of uh, like a whole 3D environment where you can add all the stuff that you want to be in your scene. Um, and so to add stuff to your scene, you need to have things, and those are called 3D models. And 3D modeling is just the process of making those things and not even worrying about like the color or the lighting or anything, just giving them the shape that you want them to have. <clears throat> 3D animation is when you take those things that you made and you make them move. So once again, if you look on the top right, this is like a really basic model of a figure. And you can see all these triangles and circles and squares. Uh, that's part of a rig, which is what you use to control the animation of a character. So they're at like every movable joint on the character. And animators just use these controls to pose the character across the whole sequence. Uh, it's similar to 2D animation, like, it, like in old Disney films where they draw every frame. But in this case, it's just like they position this, uh, this whole setup for each frame. Um, so yeah, a lot of people just associate it with character animation, but there's also stuff like just anything that has to be CGI that also moves, you have to animate it. So like <clears throat> vehicles as well. Uh, I have a list here, just some things like mechanical structures, trees blowing in the wind, just actually anything that moves yeah, it has to be CGI, you have to animate it. Shading and materials. So if you look down here, these are some examples of materials. Because a material is just um, <clears throat> it's just anything that uh, tells the computer what to make something look like in terms of what it's made of. So you got like sand, bricks, leather, tile, really just anything that uh, that you need to make something be made out of. So if you want to make a wooden table you have to give the computer a way to distinguish it from a metal table. So the way you do this is you just control the albedo, which is the color, the specularity, which is how reflective it is, 
the metalness, which is how metallic it is, the roughness, which is how diffused the reflections are, the sheen, which is like how the reflections interact with the geometry, the bump, normal, and displacement all control like little, I, all the way from small bumps to big indents. And the transmission has to do with how light passes through it. <clears throat> so like if you shine a flashlight up to your ear or your hand, and you get like the weird orange glow that goes through your hand, that's called subsurface scattering. And that's how you'd control that with, with transmission. And then emission is if you need to have your object emit light, <clears throat> you'd use an emission material. And <clears throat> that would just make it cast light on everything else in the scene. Lighting, speaking of lighting. Um, lighting for CGI is pretty similar to lighting for film in terms of the theory behind it. Because most of the time, if you're doing a visual effects shot, you have to try to match the lighting to the lighting that was used on set when they filmed that shot. So usually the lighting artists will go in and they'll just try to replicate the lighting that they had on set. If you look down here, this is a standard three-point lighting setup. So you have your object here. Imagine the camera's like right here where my mouse is. Then you have the backlight to give it like an edge, key light to really light it, and then a fill light to make it not be so harsh. It's You'd use the same theory for lighting for CGI. And so basically once they match the lighting from on set and they see how it's interacting with all the models and stuff, with all their materials applied, then they can take all the creative liberties they need to to make sure that it still looks good because the director of photography can't really account for the CGI being added when they are lighting the scene because they can't see it yet because it's happening later. Rendering. So that's taking the uh, whole setup that you have in your scene being viewed through the digital camera and turning it into an image. So this is a very long process because the computer has to simulate the world basically. And so that just takes a lot of time for it to resolve the image. Uh, I did two visual effects shots for this project, and the first one took 27 hours total to render. So it takes a long time. You could make it take less time, but the less time you have it rendering, the lower the quality is going to be. And the higher time you have it rendering, the, more, the higher quality it's going to be. So it just, you have to budget your time. Uh, usually you render out each image separately for each frame and then sequence them later, which is just better for certain file types. Uh, and then you also render out different render passes, which are just different. Uh, you render out like several different sequences, and they all are of different parts of the scene, which is used now in compositing. Here you can see from the first shot, here are three passes that I used. This is, I'll go into what they all are later more, but you can just see them here, examples of render passes, which you use in compositing. So compositing is the process of taking all of those render passes and then combining them into one image. And then once you've combined all the render passes into one image, then you merge those render passes uh, onto the actual footage and make sure that it blends seamlessly and actually looks really good. So it looks like everything is just part of one thing, even though they're all from separate places and sources down in the pipeline. Uh, this is pretty much the only, I think this is, this is like the only step out of the whole process that you need to do for every shot because maybe you, the other one would be match move you might have to do match move for every shot but if the camera's locked off on a tripod you won't have to do that so this is the only one that you really have to do for every shot because no shot is done until you've actually put everything together um and you might think that you don't have much control in compositing since you've already done all of the work in the 3d side of things but uh it's actually one of the biggest processes a lot of stuff changes once you do the compositing Shot one, so I did two shots, this is the first one. So my plan was to just find an idea for a shot that I could try to integrate every part of the workflow that I just described in one shot so that I could demonstrate all of it at once. So the technical idea that I had was to just like have one shot of real footage and then transition to a different shot of real footage by merging the gap with CGI. So it goes from real footage to CGI to a different shot of real footage. Um, so my creative idea for how I was going to incorporate that into, into a shot was I have a camera go up to a hole in a rock, and then it goes in and becomes CGI, and you see an underground cave that's all CGI, and then it emerges from a pipe, and that's when it's back to real footage. So. 
this is the shot. I'm going to, uh, I can't really put the link. I'll put the link in all the links to all these things that I show into the Zoom chat at the end because playing stuff on Zoom is sometimes kind of tricky, but hopefully it's not too bad, although it definitely might be. So here's the real footage. <clears throat> now it's transitioned to the part where it's CGI. It's dark right now. That's on purpose. So now this is all CGI. This is the part where it's under the underground, it's all CGI. And then once it leaves this area and it emerges from the pipe, then we are back to real footage. So now it's real again. Sorry if that was choppy, but I'll post the link at the end so that you can see. Um, so here are my render passes uh, that I used. This up here at the top, this is the final result. Right here, down, down at, the, at the top left, this is the emission pass. So this just has the stuff that's emitting light. So this is, it's the only thing emitting light here is the lava. So I just have that pass and that's helpful because I can use it to control how bright or dark the lava is. Down at the bottom left, this is a light pass. So this just has all the light that's being emitted from the lava and how it's interacting with the whole environment with all its materials and stuff. Uh, this pass up here with all the smoke, that's a synthesized pass that I made in compositing just using uh, this pass down here, which is similar to a render pass, but it's actually an info pass. <clears throat> and this just gives me information uh, <clears throat> about the depth of the scene. So here's another video. And this just has a bit of a breakdown of the shots. So this is just different passes that I used in compositing. It's the same ones that I showed you before, but just in motion this time. Um, I could play the rest of it. I just sort of shows all of them, but it might just be too choppy, so it might not be worth it, actually. So the challenges that I faced for this shot, uh, the transitions from real footage to CG and then to real again, that's a hard thing to do because you need to make it totally seamless and you need to make it so that it doesn't just suddenly abruptly cut to a different one and then you're just really taken out of it. You need to make it so that it's a seamless transition so it doesn't look like the camera cuts at any point. So the way that I solved this was to make sure that the different parts of it were all being revealed from behind something else so it can wipe onto screen from behind something. So at the first one, as the camera enters the rock, as the crevice starts to pass over the camera, it's revealing the CGI part. And then it goes in there, and then when it exits the, when it exits the pipe, I just have the CGI part get obscured by the top of the pipe as the camera moves up. So that way you can just seamlessly transition between the two. Uh, and it was also helpful that it was in shadow because when everything is dark, it's a lot easier to cover your mistakes. Scene complexity, that was another issue that I faced. So because this shot has like a whole CG environment with a lot of uh, displacing materials and uh, animated displacing materials, which is even harder, uh, lots of objects in the scene, very complex materials, uh, it just means that it's gonna take a long time to render, which means it's gonna take a longer time to see how, your cha how the changes that you're making are affecting the result. And it also means that just while you're working, everything's going to start slowing down because this is visual effects are pretty much the most intense thing that you can do on a computer. And uh, this is an intense visual effects shot, so it's even more intense. And then also time, of course. Time is always a big thing with visual effects. So this was a very ambitious shot to do uh, until I started doing practice shots for this capstone. I'd never done a shot like this before at all. Um, and I kept needing more and more time than I planned to work on this shot, to work on this shot, because I just wasn't happy with the result yet. And so getting a shot to a point where you're happy with it while staying on course with your time is very difficult because as you keep going, all the improvements start taking longer and longer. And that's something that I wanted to explore more with shot two. So I wanted to further explore how the length of time I spend working on a shot affects the quality of it. So the technical idea for this was just to do a simple shot and then just show how the quality increased over time with various amounts of time spent working on that same shot, just to show the progression and show how the amount of time 
changes and how the quality changes while that time changes. Uh, the creative idea was just to have an animated emissive shape in a pretty dark environment because I just thought that would be a pretty easy way to represent the quality increase. So I'll just play it. Once again, I'll put this link into the Zoom chat at the end so you can see it without all the choppiness. So that was the shot. And like I said, I just thought that this shot with this concept would just demonstrate what I was trying to say about the time pretty well. And I was right. Because um, just a lot of things that slowly take more time do make a big difference in this shot because it's emitting light in a dark environment. So it's going to be casting some obvious light on the things around it. And then also there's uh, water on the ground. And because this is so bright, it's definitely going to be pretty obviously reflecting in the water. And those are both things that can be done, but they take more time. So uh, this is the first version of the shot. And as you can see, it looks a lot worse. There's no light shining out from it. There's no bloom in the camera. It's really just very bare bones. This took two hours, 10 minutes to get to this step. And that's just because uh, the first one is always going to take sort of like a base level of time because there's a lot of things that you can't that you just can't get out of doing. But then it starts improving a lot faster. This one took two hours, 45 minutes to do, or at just an extra 35 minutes from the other one. And you can see this, it already looks a lot better because now uh, the bright object is flaring out in the camera sensor, which is why it sort of looks like it's glowing a lot more than before. If you look at this one, there's really no reaction. Like it's super dark around it, but here it's a lot brighter. And that's just something that happens when light hits the camera sensor, it blooms out. And so that makes a big difference. So now we're at three hours, 30 minutes of working on it, I got environment lighting. So now you can see in this one, there's light being cast by the object on the environment. And that makes a big difference with the realism of it, uh, especially in such a dark environment where you know that there'd be a lot of light. Four hours, 15 minutes. At four hours, 15 minutes, I was able to add reflections, which at first you might not notice that there aren't reflections when you don't have them. But if you do notice that, you'll be like, oh, that's weird. That's kind of weird that there aren't reflections. And then when you see it with it, you actually can tell it does kind of make a big difference. Um, I might not be able to tell on Zoom, but you can tell here. Now, five hours, 40 minutes. So this is like a big increase of time. So you might think, wow, it's going to look way better. No, not really. It kind of looks the same. Um, this is mostly just like, I'm as if the visual effects artist and as somebody who's probably the biggest critic of this shot, um, I could tell that it made a big difference. Things that I did was I made the flaring have more texture, I just added some more displacement from the heat around the object, things like that. And it took the most time with the least quality influence. So you can see here, version one, kind of a lot worse than version two with just an extra 35 minutes. And then here, version three, just an extra 45 minutes and you got the light on the ground. That's a pretty big quality influence if you know what to look for. Plus 130 minutes. It's not that much better. It's definitely better, but it's not that much better. Um, this is version five that I have right here that I only showed four things because the changes between versions four and five were just so hard to perceive <laughs> to anybody who doesn't know what they're looking for that it's just, I didn't feel like I should. <laughs> so does this apply to everybody. Does this whole thing of all the time that you spend on it starts meaning less as you go? Does it apply to everybody that does this? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's just a thing. <laughs> so this is where I was taking my project. I wanted to figure out if a lot of other people had the same experience and uh, they do. So one of my first sources was this TED Talk by Ren Weichman, who is a visual effects artist and content creator online. And in his TED talk, he mentions the movie Black Panther. And there's a very specific scene in it where uh, he just thought that the visual effects suddenly got a lot worse from the rest of the movie. 
And then he looked more into it and he found that they reshot that whole scene uh, pretty last minute. And the visual effects team had only two weeks to do all like 30, 40 shots. And so the visual effects quality suffered a lot because that exact same team had actually won the Oscar for best visual effects like four times. And it was just because they didn't have any time, they couldn't show their full skill because they just couldn't in that amount of time. The other big source that I used to find this out was my interview. I interviewed Scott Wojcik, who I was uh, given the contact of for my mentor. And I interviewed him and it was very helpful because I found out from like an actual professional that I spoke to that he agrees with this sentiment. So he works in 3D computer graphics and especially like managing people, which is very helpful for this because that means that he has a good amount of experience with like directing people and uh, having to predict the amount of time that you have to work on a project. And in his experience, actually, clients realize how big of an effect it is, like just like the difference between time spent on something and the quality, that they are actually like very lenient about it. And if like, if they can, they'll give you more time if they think it'll be better. So I also know from my own experience, because I've been doing this for three years and from the beginning, I've always been like, yeah, okay. So if I spend more time on this, this will keep getting better. But when I started, because I didn't have as much skill, uh, it, there was kind of like a cap for skill. Like I'd work on something for three hours and I'd be like, oh, if I work on this for another hour, it's going to get better. And then after that, I'm like, I, I don't know what else to do. I'm, I'm done, I guess. And so it's just like, yeah, this looks fine, but I don't know how to take it any further. And now after three more years of doing this, yeah, sure. In that first couple hours, I'll get it to a better point than I used to. But the bigger thing is just that now I know what to do for the next four hours, the next eight hours, how to keep making it better. And that's one of the bigger skills that I've learned rather than doing stuff faster. I've learned how to do more. And so it still takes time because this isn't something that you can do fast and well at the same time. But, um, I've just learned how to take everything further. And just as you keep getting more and more skilled, it just becomes more and more true because there's more and more you can do. So I would imagine that um, for the Oscar winning visual effects team who only had two or three weeks to work on a whole scene, this was very true. The annoying part about this is that the whole second half of the time you spend working on a shot, which could be up to like, well, like 16 hours for like a complex shot for me, probably several days for a whole studio, is that that whole second half is just taking it from an eight out of 10 to a 10 out of 10. And in the movie studio's case, probably like an 11 out of 10. And it's just, it's really unfortunate because there's a lot of people who won't be able to tell the difference, but you have to do it for the people who will. And so it's just, <laughs> it's really annoying when you're like, all right, it's eight out of 10. I really want it to be a little better. It's going to take me probably another 10 hours and some people won't be able to tell the difference, but that's just part of it. So what did I learn? I learned a lot of new things just from like the experience of doing that first shot. Because every time you do a new visual effects shot, you always learn a lot. There's a lot, oh, you always learn new tricks that you'll use in future shots. So I learned a lot from that because that was a very ambitious shot because it's just a lot of a lot of things that I didn't know how I was going to do. And I had to learn along the way. Uh, and then I also learned a lot from my interview because uh, I don't talk to industry professionals very often. So um, talking to him about this and seeing that he had a similar experience to me was pretty cool. The end. Uh, if anybody has a question, you can ask it. I'll have to stop sharing though so that I can actually see. Oh, never mind. I can see. I got you. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, really, really nicely done questions that people have. Thank you, Mr. Ripa. Thank you, Ms. Floor. Xander, how did you get into the field of visual effects and learn how to do what you can do, which is incredible? 
I had a pretty bad app on my iPad that <laughs> let you do like really simple visual effects. And I was like, wow, this is so cool. This looks so good. And it didn't, but that's fine. And so I was like, wow, this is really cool. And then my friend Sylvie and I started like trying to make a short film with our iPads. And um, I was like using that app to do stuff. And I was like, this is really fun. And so I started watching YouTube videos on it. And I found out, whoa, there's this really cool program called After Effects. And I can do so much more with it. And so eventually uh, I got After Effects as a gift and uh, I got it on my dad's old laptop. Mm -hmm. And then I started experimenting with it. And I was like, this is really hard. Maybe I'll just use the iPad app. But then eventually I was like, that's too limiting. I have to keep doing this. And so then I was like, whoa, this is way more fun when I do it like this. And so I just kept going and then I kept learning new, new softwares and which I, I'm still doing. I still just keep learning new software because there's always so much more that you can learn just as long as you get the new software for it. So it's just, what, just the most interesting thing to me right now. So it's just, it's really fun. And are you learning through a lot of trial and error or YouTube videos yes. or articles? Um, I used to learn a lot from YouTube videos when I was starting out because it's just, uh, there's a lot of resources online about this and just how to use software. But now that I know how to use the software a lot, um, I, it's mostly trial and error because that's just a more fun way to learn. So like, I'll just come up with an idea just like, hmm, I want to try to do this type of shot, kind of like I did with my first shot, where I didn't know how to, I was going to do a lot of it. But because I have a pretty good understanding of the software, I can figure out as I go, like, okay, so I've done this before on this previous shot. Maybe this could apply here if I just change it like this. And then I just keep experimenting with that until I come up with a final result. Yeah, and Pat asked if you plan to um, continue with this path of visual effects in college. I do, yes. I have uh, several colleges that I'm looking at, and we narrowed it down to only colleges with a visual effects major, because this is definitely what I want to do in college and as a career. Very, very cool. Other questions for Xander? Go ahead. Um, hi, Xander. Um, are there, is there a certain kind of um, physics of certain objects or materials or movements that are more hard to capture than others? Yeah, so um, a lot of things that have to do with physics are hard. Uh, a lot of the software can simulate it because it has the math. It knows the math on like how to get stuff to do what it's supposed to, like how to drop a two pound ball onto a piece of wood or something like that. And then you tell it and it can compute it. But uh, a lot of these things are things that you have to really dial in and make sure that it works. And then for materials, there are a lot of things that just, you have to make sure that they are actually gonna be realistic. Cause a lot of things that you can do in the software aren't things that reality can do. Um, and so you just have to make sure that you're working within the constraints of reality because you can very easily go beyond that. And then it starts looking unrealistic because it's just beyond what you can usually see in real life. And you're going to just start recognizing that it's a little off. So you have to make sure that you recreate everything faithfully because you see the world every day. So you're very good at recognizing when it's something that doesn't look like it's part of it. Any other questions? Go ahead. Sandra, do you look at movies differently now? That you yes. Know? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, when I watch a movie, uh, a lot of it, I'm just like, ooh, how do they do that? I want to do that. That's fun. And then if they have bad visual effects, I'm like, ooh, I'm disappointed in them. That's really upsetting. So. I definitely pay a lot of attention to the visual effects when I watch things now, which is, you know, fun, but also a curse. Right. Some people really don't enjoy watching movies with you. Go ahead, Max. <laughs> um, was the app that you were talking about on your iPad Epic Flare? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that one. <laughs> Um, all right, one final question. Um, what did you learn about yourself as a learner doing a capstone project? Um, I learned that, I mean, I already kind of knew this, but this was a good example of this is that I learn a lot better by doing than I do from anything else because my sources were helpful, 
um, like quite helpful actually. A lot of them were pretty interesting, especially the interview. But um, actually like doing the shots and showing myself that I was right about this whole thing with the time, just by actually experimenting with that, with an actual shot, two shots actually, um, that was like the most informative thing because I saw how it actually happened for me. Mm -hmm. And I was able to just be like, all right, so this is how it works. This is how it relates to this and everything like that. So that's probably the biggest thing I learned about myself as a learner for this. Very, very good. Well, well done. Round of, virtual round of applause. All right. This is Tommy McLean, and this is his capstone project. Take it away, Tommy. Hi, I'm Tommy McLean, and my capstone project was wood turning for beginners. A little bit about me. Hi, I'm Tommy McLean. I'm a senior at Guilford High School, and I really enjoy woodworking. I started woodworking classes with Mr. Hackett in sophomore year, and I've loved it ever since. Unfortunately, in May of 2020, I lost my grandfather. I was extremely devastated and completely crushed. He had a love for woodworking, so I think he handed it to me. I also think the pandemic played a big role in my woodworking as well. I had a lot of time on my hands, and I lost interest in a lot of video games, and I was looking for a new hobby. What is wood turning? Wood turning is the art of using a lathe with handheld gouges and chisels to cut a symmetrical shape. You can make just about anything with a lathe as long as it can be spun and carved into a cylindrical shape. Here's some examples. Uh, let me turn my video on. Start video, here we go. Um, I made this little cup here and it, with a little honey dowel. I have this little dish, another little dish, and then Mr. Hackett will recognize this, but I made this in woodshop class. Um, why I chose wood turning. I chose wood turning after I learned it in woodshop class. After I completed my first lathe project in, in school, I bought one right away. I find it very, very satisfying to take a log or a small stack of lumber and turn it into a really cool piece of art. Why I chose capstone. I chose capstone because my counselor, Miss Fitting, recommended it to me. She told me it would look good on my transcript for college. I also chose it because it's very independent the entire time, from choosing your topic, planning, scheduling, to, and creating the project itself. I thrive when I have independence and flexibility to do something on my own. What I learned. I learned a lot more than I thought I was going to learn. Uh, not only did I learn more about my topic, but I also learned a, lo a lot about filming, video editing, lighting, audio editing, and even teaching. I, I was surprised by the number of things I learned throughout the process. What I liked. I enjoyed the entire process of the Capstone Project, but there are a few things that stood out. Like I mentioned before, the independence, being able to pick a topic I was passionate about and share it with other people. I also got to present it in a way I wanted, the how-to video. I also like the teaching aspect of it. Being able to teach people who watch my video about what I love to do felt good and very natural. I found that pretty odd because I can never see myself being a teacher or anything, doing anything teaching for that matter, but this project opened my eyes to that path. What I didn't like, time was my main issue. I wish I had more time to go uh, more in depth with my project. Um, I wish I did the full year instead of just a semester. Um, but resources and materials were also an issue. Due to the supply chain issues and other issues right now in the world, lumber prices uh, are extremely high. So I resorted, use, uh, resorted to using free pallet wood. Another issue I had was uh, my knowledge about video editing. I wish I knew more about video editing. The last thing I, uh, I didn't like were the journal entries. To be honest, I felt like they didn't bring much value to my project or process. Let's dig deeper. What you'll need. So I'm gonna go over the process of what I did to go from a stack of lumber to my cup. Um, you'll need a speed square, dimensional lumber, a saw, wood glue, PPE, eye protection, dust mask, and even a jacket that you don't mind messing up, a lathe, obviously, a set of lathe tools, and a chuck cutting the wood and gluing it. Once you have your lumber, it's time to cut it. Use a table saw. I used a table saw, but you can use a hand saw or a chop saw. You're going to cut squares out of your wood. 
For example, my piece of wood was five inches wide, so I cut it five inches to make a five by five piece of wood. You're going to glue it up and clamp it down. Don't clamp it too tight, you might compromise the bond. And there's the photo of the stack of wood glued up. Finding, finding the center. Once you have your blank, you're gonna to want to find the center so you can mount the faceplate. The faceplate attaches the blank to the lathe. Using a speed square, line up the corners and make a line diagonal across the top of your blank. Do that twice. Where the two lines intersect is where your center is. Align the faceplate with the center mark at center and mark and drill holes for the mounting screws. The fun part, making the, the blank cylindrical. Um, once you once you have your faceplate mounted, screw on the blank to the lathe. Turn on your lathe on a low speed and using a roughing gouge to take off excess material until your blank is cylindrical. I have a video here. For, there we go. It's just a little video of me turning it and making it all cylindrical. Making the tenant to go in our truck. Using a parting tool, we're going to go about half an inch up from the opposite side of the faceplate. We're, uh, we're going to make a tenon to put into our chuck. Going slow and with even pressure, we're going to dig in about a quarter of an inch and continue to do that, moving the, uh, away from the faceplate side. Putting our cup in the chuck. After we make the tenon, we're gonna put our, our cup we will take our cup off the lathe and unscrew the faceplate. On the opposite end of the cup, where we made our tenant, we'll put the chuck on. Put the tenant, I put the tenant in the chuck and tighten the chuck. Once we're done with that, we'll mount the chuck and cup back on the lathe. shaping, sanding, and finishing the outside. Once you have the blank, a cylindrical, and on the chuck, you can now move to shaping it. Using a skew chisel, I shaped the cup, I shaped the cup to your desired shape. I did a slight taper from the top, getting narrower towards the bottom. Once I have my rough shape, I can then sand and put finish on the outside. I went from 80 grit, 120 grit, to 220 grit sandpaper. The lower the, lower the number, the more aggressive the sandpaper is. For my finish, I used tried and true linseed oil and beeswax. Here's just a quick video of me doing a little sanding. Carving out the inside. Using the round nose scraper, we're gonna hollow out the inside. We're going to turn the lathe speed up a little more to allow the scraper to cut through the wood easier. Using medium pressure and going slow in a back and forth motion, we're going to start moving a lot of the material very quickly. Leave about a quarter inch on the, on the edges. We don't want them to be too weak. Sanding the inside. Going from 80, 120 to 220, sand the inside of the cup. The lathe speed should be really high. So I'm just going on the outside, on the uh, the inside rim of the cup, and just on a little bit of the outside, 
And then a little later in the little clip here, I'll go towards the center. I'm just trying to make everything smooth and go to the recommended grit for the finish. Finishing the cup. Take the same finish you used on the outside and apply it on the inside using a disposable towel. We're just applying the finish, turning my lathe a little bit, getting a thin coat, and then I'll turn it on here and I'll buff it, buff it out just to get the coat even. And then I'm going to go in with some steel wool and I'm just going to take any bits of dust out that got stuck on the finish while I was spinning the lathe. And then I do one more coat just to um, even out any spots that didn't get hit with the first coat. And then again, I'll, I'll buff it out. Taking off the tenon. Undo the chuck and remove the cup from the lathe. Using a saw, I used a pull saw to, and saw off the tenon. And then you've got yourself a cup. Are there any questions? Ah, nice job. Thank you. Very cool. Questions? Yeah, do you have any questions, anyone? Go ahead, Mr. Hackett. I don't know if you can hear me, but I don't have any questions, but uh, I can just barely hear you when, whatever. I had my tech support person, my son at home trying to solve it, but. So I, luckily you had your screens and I could see what you were saying, but uh, you did everything the right way. It looks good. So, yeah. So tell me, what was the, the hardest part? Doing the capstone part of it or doing the actual woodworking? I think doing the capstone aspect of it, um, just like planning it out. Because usually when I do projects at home, I don't really do much planning. I just kind of let my mind go when I do it and whatever comes out, comes out but I had, I wanted to create a plan for this project and it was really difficult sticking to that plan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and where did you, did you post your how-to video on YouTube? No, I, I tried sending it to you. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll post it on YouTube, we'll see. Okay, uh, well, really nicely done, Tommy. That was very interesting. I didn't really ever know how they made a wood cup or anything like that, so that was really cool. Um, so nice job and your, hold on one second. Sorry. Actually, do me a favor, do me a favor to start over. So you, I just started the recording so that your names get in there. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ava Scandone. And I'm Alexi Gibson. And we chose the design and construction of a large scale Newton's cradle. We believe that this would be both a very interesting and challenging project. Newton's Cradle is fascinating because it is an interactive experiment that demonstrates an elastic collision. Uh, you can scroll to the next slide. Firstly, what is the Newton's Cradle? Disclaimer, the cradle was not constructed by Sir Isaac Newton himself. 
It was actually credited with the design by an English actor named Simon Pebble in 1967. Pebble created this device in honor of Sir Isaac Newton to perfectly demonstrate his three laws of motion. The Newton's cradle is a model that demonstrates the conservation of momentum and energy. It is a range of pendulums, in our case, metal bocce balls, that are approximately equal in mass, length, and distance from each other. A single ball or multiple balls are lifted at an arc length, developing potential energy that will be released as kinetic energy and transferred through the rest of the balls in the ultimate collision. In the Newton's cradle, the cradle uses Newton's third law of motion, which is the conservation of energy. In a closed isolated system, the total momentum of the objects before a collision is equal to the total momentum of the objects after the collision. Momentum is neither created nor destroyed in the collision. Momentum is a vector quantity, which is a quantity of magnitude and direction that is pre precisely defined. There is no momentum that is lost, just transferred. Newton's, far Newton's first law of motion, <laughs> the law of inertia, demonstrates how a still object remains at rest while the object in motion remains in motion with constant direction and speed, unless it is acted upon by an outside force. Newton's second law of motion, the law of force and acceleration, demonstrates the force acting upon an object is generated into acceleration under the, equal, under the equation of force equals mass times acceleration. The force exerted on an object is directly proportional to its, to its mass times acceleration. Okay, you can scroll. All right. Why we choose the Newton's cradle was to better understand Newton's laws, to learn how to construct something from scratch, and to create something that demonstrates key principles of physics. I chose to do a capstone because I like the freedom of being able to choose a project topic, work with anyone I choose, and still have a deadline. I enjoyed having a deadline and checks throughout this process because it made sure that we got our work done and did not only start a project, but also finished it. My inspiration for creating a large scale Newton's Cradle was because I used to watch and greatly enjoyed the TV show, iCarly. In this TV show, in this show, a character named Spencer Shea built a giant Newton's cradle out of bowling balls that looked awesome, so I wanted to try. With such an ambitious topic, working with Ava made it so much better as we worked well together. I chose this project because I believed it would give me an amazing opportunity to challenge myself in an area I am not strong in. I am very passionate about trying new things and testing my abilities, and I believe that this capstone project gave me that opportunity. Working with someone who I work very well with is an amazing bonus, and it provided me with the confidence I needed to pursue the project. This project has taught me many things, and despite our serious complications with the project, I will not take that as a chance to quit on challenging myself, even if I am overly ambitious at times. Ambition pushes you to the finish line. Our understanding of the Newton's cradle. Newton's cradle is a closed system that creates a frictional force that can neither be created nor destroyed. The cradle encompasses an elastic collision because the momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. When one or more of the balls are lifted and released, it hits the other stationary balls and transfer their force through each other instantly. Pushing the last ball upwards, the total momentum before the collision and after the collision are equal. The balls in the Newton's cradle will not, will not swing forever because there are many outside forces that make the movement gradually lose energy, such as air friction, the sound energy when they collide, and the heat energy created by the collision. When the balls lose energy, they slow down and will eventually stop.
uh, construction ideation. To construct the project, we went through a series of process and elimination. We spent a lot of time rehearsing, making trips to Home Depot, and watching YouTube videos. The process was filled with many bumps in the road, making us attempt a di few different methods of construction. Therefore, influencing time well spent on experimentation. We knew from the beginning of Capstone that the Newton's Cradle would be constructed with PVC pipes. Initially, we decided to work with bowling balls, but gained access to a set of bowling balls the same weight was a lot more money than we would ever want to spend. After a careful consideration with our mentor, we decided on the metal bocce balls. The construction process of the Newton's Cradle. The first step was to drill into the bocce balls. It took us many tries to find the right method. We first drilled into them with a drill press, then finished going all the way through with a handheld drill. For our frame, we used PVC pipes. We hand cut the PVC into the desired lengths. Near the end of our frame cutting, we began to use a reciprocating saw to cut the pipes. To hang the bocce balls, we measured and cut string and then tied it using boat knots. We used metal clamps that required precise tightening using a screwdriver. It required many hours of work to adjust the 30 rings to sit in the required position. To fasten the process, we began to use a drill with a properly sized drill bit. One of the toughest challenges was to ensure that the balls were even from the bottom and centered perfectly in the middle of the frame. We accomplished this with lasers and trying to assist with precise measurement. And then we can skip that on. All right, yeah. And then these pictures show how we built the frame. And so at first we like measured and cut them with a handsaw, which was pretty difficult to get all the way through. And then when we put that all together in that picture, you see that was our first try. And then after we made more adjustments because we wanted to make the frame smaller. And after a while, we started using a reciprocating saw. So it was easier to go through the pipes. Go to the next slide. In this slide, this is one of the six times we reconstructed the cradle. And throughout the presentation, you'll notice that we switched from white strings to orange strings because we found that the white strings weren't strong enough to hold all of the bocce balls and there wasn't enough of it. Um, every time we would uh, tighten them with the hose clamps, they would start to shed and um, just become very choppy. And this night of construction, we realized that when we started to put all of the balls into place and we had everything equal, in approximately equal in length. We tested them out by pulling one back to the proper arc length. And when they collided, it, every ball went into a different direction. And then we realized that there was something wrong with the um, interior material of the bocce balls, which um, because there was, it was made out of clay and, or, or rubber and this would properly work with a metal ball, such as a ball bearing that is made out of metal inside and out. And we used lasers and pieces of string to try to find the center perfectly and align them very precisely. And these are a few images of that. And in, the, um, in one of our ways of constructing, we used a small, like two small little rubber circles and we put that on to hold the string and that was a reason for a lot of the movement of the balls going in different directions so without that they stayed a bit more straight but the material just doesn't um, transmit the energy as we want to. Nearing the end of the construction process Alexi and I came across an unfortunate occurrence which we previously mentioned Due to material malfunctions, 
the use of the bocce balls prevented the Newton's cradle to perfectly and continually collide. We discovered through the help of GHS's physics teachers that because the bocce balls were not solid inside, the kinetic energy that was supposed to transfer did not. Our mentor, my dad, broke eight drill bits while drilling into all 14 of the bocce balls because it was nearly impossible to drill evenly through. We proceeded to use a large eye bolt instead of a smaller one because it was, it was small and it slid out of the ball easily. In addition to the larger eye bolt, we put a screw cap at the bottom of the bolt to secure it. There was also a peculiar powder that profusely projected out of the Bashi balls when we were drilling into it, which was quite concerning. Even though the Bashi balls had a metal finish on the outside, it would have been successful if the balls were entirely metal inside and out. Instead, the balls inside may be, may be a type of clay or rubber. Before this occurred, drilling into the balls was one of the hardest parts of the entire construction process. Lessons for next time. In the future, we would like to make a smaller scale Newton's cradle. The smaller size would enable us to use more commonly available materials that would produce the proper physical properties. Instead of using bocce balls, we could we would like to try using metal ball bearings and glue attachments that would secure the balls on both sides of the cradle. Another option we may investigate, investigate is the use of pool balls as they are solid and would have transferred the energy better than bocce balls. In terms of process, we would like to discuss ideas with others earlier in the process as it may lead to helpful insights. For our personal growth within this whole capstone, I have learned that even though I do not have experience at all within the field of physics or knowledge pertaining to physics, I have proved to myself that I am capable of accomplishing something and perceiving through malfunctions with a determination for success and faith of success. This project was draining, but by the time we completed constructions, we couldn't have been prouder of ourselves for accomplishing something that at one point seemed very difficult. I didn't complete this project just to learn about physics. I completed this for the experience. We learned through serious complications that if we would like to reattempt re the cradle in the future, we have attained worthy knowledge and experience pertaining to how we could access successfully attempt to reconstruct had we been able to have access to the proper materials. I really enjoyed to have the opportunity to work on a project where we freely had the choice to work on something of our own choosing. Our own choosing. Overall, this was a very positive and exciting experience. I have learned that in times of doubt, in times like nothing is working the way you thought, that it is okay. I learned that failure is okay and shouldn't be a problem. We had many problems that we have overcome and I am very proud of our work. Sometimes during the construction, we had no idea what else we could do, making me learn that without the end and success wouldn't be the same. I have learned to persevere along with persevering in an independent project is much harder for me than in a paired project. I've learned to enjoy what you're doing, even if it is for school and gets stressful. The problems that occurred in the project were what made it real, and if we had no troubles, then the project wouldn't have taught us anything. I've learned that I work more productively in paired projects compared to individual, and without failure, success wouldn't be the same. And that is the end of our slideshow, and we'll want to demonstrate something with our actual new it's cradle. So should we like we're just gonna move this a little closer? And then I'll move the one yes. So this is the full Newton's cradle. We just put it on, on a high surface just to present it. So we have 14 metal bocce balls 
And we're first going to show you how it works with, is, can you see it? Okay. So we're going to show you how it works with one, and then we're going to um, take away most of them and then show you how it works with three. So as you can see, like there's not enough kinetic energy to go through to successfully make uh, multiple collisions back and forth. There's only enough for one. Yes. So now we're going to show you three. Do you want me to actually pull both sides? Well, what's a bit better? But then they like start swinging together. Which was something that we noticed that what before we um, came up with a solution to create more of, of a constant collision. Before this, there was no like only that one collision, same as all 14 balls. But came up with adding two screws in between the eye bolts to conserve the energy within the ball. And that's why it works more efficiently with just three. But what we notice is that even though there's um, not much of an ongoing collision, they will sway uniformly back and forth for a period of time, which is not typically supposed to happen, but that was the only constant thing. Yeah, that like shows like the inelastic and elastic. Right. And now we have some calculations that we made about how it works. I don't know if you can really read that, but um, this is the potential energy calculation, and then this is the kinetic energy one. So you can see how they were both 4.6 joules and then 4.6, so they're equal and shouldn't lose any um, energy. Um, so for the um, Newton's um, unit of force, so the Newton is kilograms times mass over seconds squared. The potential energy, which is also U, is equal to mass times gravity times height. And the uh, kinetic energy is equal to half the mass times velocity squared. And then the uh, momentum is uh, kilograms times mass over seconds, meters per second. And these are also known as Newton seconds. Yeah. So this is the arc length. Yeah. For, to show, can't really see it, but yeah. Our plank is the ball pulled back. Yeah, that's like the ball on the ball. And then we use the Pythagorean theorem to find this length. And then this length is the length between the um, the brackets up here that are holding the balls. That get those clamps. Yeah, those clamps. Uh, now, yeah, I think so. All right, so um, we have time for questions, right? Yeah, definitely. Questions for these persevering scientists. <laughs> no questions? Look at all these people on here. Um, well, girls, I am, um, for one, I'm very impressed with um, what you did and um, how you, you really persevered through these trials. And um, truthfully, one of my favorite moments you talked about happening, but you may not even know that I knew that it happened. I was sitting in our pod and I heard uh, two physics teachers talking about Newton's cradle and balls. And I was like, What's, what are you guys talking about? And they were like, oh, the two students that came to talk to us about their capstone project. So. I was really proud to hear that you guys went and um, 
asked for help and sought out your resources because I think that is such a valuable skill. And I even like how you mentioned um, that you wish you had done that sooner, that you, you know, one of the things that you learn is to like go talk to people, reach out um, when you're struggling. Because I think like as students, um, I think that's one of the biggest things is students will be struggling and they'll just struggle in their own selves instead of like going to find someone who can help them. So I'm just so impressed how you guys, you know, sat there and stood there and showed like, hey, this didn't work perfectly, but here's how we could do it next time. Here's what we learned from those mistakes. Here's how we figured out how we could show that some of it does work and make changes. And I just think that was so very, very impressive. Um, and honestly, my biggest, you answered all of my questions that I normally ask Capstone students by being so super reflective throughout the entire presentation. So kudos to you both. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts or questions or compliments? It can be compliments, moms and dads. We are very proud of the girls. And as, as moms and dads, we're very proud of their accomplishments. Truly, they worked very hard. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> is, that your, is that your mentor I see there, ladies? Yeah, and he was very helpful in the class. <laughs> That's my Thanks. dad. Very, very helpful. Hi, everybody. Yeah, it's a phenomenal job. Uh, I, I, Gave them a good workout, and their efforts uh, were, were stellar. A lot of time spent tweaking and, and measuring and testing, and without the slightest bit of a disappointment, made a, a tremendous uh, effort to, to persevere through this. Material uh, uh, sciences. Uh, And a shout out from um, Aunt Jenny and very proud of you girls. And uh, Madison, I saw how hard you guys worked during the school year and seeing you guys so determined to find new ways around the obstacles. So proud of you guys from your pal, Madison. Um, so really nice job, everyone.